Hi everyone, welcome to Dennis Deep Cuts. Uh, it's the 44th installment of this fine YouTube series. Today, we're gonna talk about Revolution Rock. Let's see what happens. One of the things that always define me as an artist, uh, musician, songwriter, singer, lyricist, <laughs> what have you, is that, that my creative outputs have always been widely political. Um, so today I want to show you 10 records that shaped my political thinking. 10 records that were really important to me, especially early on, to sort of get me on the path of, of political ideas. Uh, once I discovered music, I mean, before music I wasn't that interested in politics, I thought it was dumb. But once I discovered music, I discovered politics and then I met a ton of cool people and uh, I started reading books and I educated myself about political ideas. I think that for me it's always been a matter of like if you are going to talk about political issues in your songs and you need to be able to talk about political issues in depth uh, outside the music. So I always had made a point of educating myself and really digging deep into political ideas. Um, but I'm going to show you some of the starting points, some of the albums and artists that really, you know, helped me uh, become the person that I am today. Being a person that's been known to be politically outspoken on every platform, when I started this YouTube channel, I wanted it to be focused mainly on, on music art culture and creativity and not be so uh, bogged down with my political ramblings but seeing uh, the shape that the world in, is in today i figured that we could use a good dose of, of political music to to get us excited um, i always thought that like some people say you know, you're preaching to the converted but i think that just to get together in a room and you talk about political ideas that you might share and have in common uh, gives you comfort and might give you strength and might, might inspire you and that's what music always done to me and I hope that this little list of, of records can inspire you or you know give you some comfort or strength or something to get into when you're angry or sad or upset about you know about the way the world looks right now um, so let's dig into some cool music and uh, yeah let's see what happens so before punk and hardcore politics didn't really exist to me. Um, I was a metalhead. There's a couple of bands in, in the metal world that, that touched upon political issues. Like you had your, uh, you know, Nuclear Assault or Sacred Rush. And even I was a massive fan of Napalm Death. But I think at that point in my life, I didn't realize that they were super political and that they came from like the, the punk world. I just, I just love the fact that they played really fast music. Um, so when I discovered punk and hardcore, um, it gave me a language to sort of express my alienation and express my anger uh, and frustration. <clears throat> and it was very much a part of the uniform of, of punk and hardcore. It's like, you're supposed to look a certain way, you're supposed to sound a certain way, you're supposed to sing a certain way. And, and the way you were supposed to sing was a lot of like fuck the system type of uh, jargon. Uh, which I really liked. I thought it was, you know, quite fascinating and <clears throat> you know, quite powerful. But then I, I bought a record that changed everything for me. And I'm, I am, of course, talking about um, the Dead Kennedys compilation, Give Me Convenience of Give Me Death from 1987. Came out a year after the Dead Kennedys broke up. Uh, I've talked about this record on the first ever YouTube episode, a uh, record that did change my life. Um, and it did. Um, not only the sound, and, you know, the playing, and, uh, you know, the artworks and the, the, the cut and paste uh, posters that that Dead Kennedys had, but they were a band that talked about politics, but they talked about politics in, in a smart, intelligent and funny way. And um, <clears throat> it made me sort of realize that politics could have more of depth than just fuck the system. And this is honestly a record that changed everything for me. Um, Dead Kennedys became one of my all-time favorite bands, of course. And I read every word on every lyric and I was super excited about it. And um, it's one of those records that without it, I would not be here today. And then, you know, of course, f following Jello Biafra's career and, and all the stuff that he put out. After the Dead Kennedys, um, truly a game changer for me.
Next record I want to show you is um, European Harko Band. This is a 10 inch from 1992. It's Manlifting Banner 10 inches that shook the world. Manlifting Banner is, because they got back together a couple of years back and they're still playing shows. They're a Dutch straight edge communist band. Uh, a lot of those, the, a couple of those guys used to be in Lerm and seen red and also a straight edge band called Profound, which I think was just a project. But Manlifting Banner are amazing. I would say that they're one of the best European hardcore bands of all time. Their lyrics are super confrontational, are super sort of violent, but like in, in all the perfect ways. And uh, this record and their seven inch um, that came out the year before called Myth of Freedom were really important for me. Uh, but also the fact that they're part of this little scene. And um, when I had my band Step Forward, which is my, my second band, my first really hardcore band, uh, I, I got the Profound 7-inch from Crucial Response Records, which is a German label that's still around today. And I wrote them a letter. I think I might have sent them a demo or something. And they responded and they sent me information about, you know, they sent me flyers and <clears throat> information about Man Living Banner. And they sent me some pamphlets and about communism and, and political ideas. And it blew my mind. And it was really important to me to realize that, oh, shit you know, some dumb kid from Sweden sent them a letter and they, they responded and was like, here's some information if you want to know more about politics. Uh, that was really, really important to me. Um, me and David, we still talk about Man Lifting Manor a lot. They're one of those bands that really refused to sound anything like them, but the way um, they attacked in their lyrics was really important to us. So I think Man Lifting Manor was one of those bands that Man Lifting Manor and that world around them was massively important to me. So uh, yeah, the fucking great band. And if you don't know them, do yourself a favor and check them out. Also, a couple of those guys did a band called Dead Stool Pigeon. After Man Leaves the Banner, they're great. And also, of course, the latter, Seeing Red, fantastic bands. So sometimes you think about the sliding doors aspect of your life. What would have happened if I gone down this path instead of that one? And one of the things that maybe not a whole lot of people know about me is that in the late 80s, I got into punk rock around 1987. Um, and, you know, I started my first punk band in 1989. We started Step Horror, was my first horror band. At the same time, I was just buying punk and hardcore records and, and still to an extent, maybe some metal as well. Uh, I bought the first Beast Boys record. I loved it. I bought the first Public Enemy records. I bought the first Run DMC record. I bought the Fat Boys record. And I was really intrigued and fascinated by hip hop. And uh, one of the records that really spoke to me was, of course, uh, Public Enemy. I, in general, I mean, it takes a nation a million to hold us back. Um, I saw the video for Fight the Power. I saw the Bring the Noise uh, crossover with Anthrax, which I thought was super cool. And it made me really excited about this. And also then discovering just how political Public Enemy was. It was like every word is confrontational. Every word is political. Everything has a meaning. And that was something that was super important to me. Um, I didn't really dive into much hip hop after that. I had this first burst of buying all those cool hip hop records. But the way they carry themselves in Public Enemy, like they were like this weird gang and um, they were quite militant about their politics. That was something that I found really fascinating and really extraordinary. And then I think about the sliding doors aspect of my life. What if I would have gone down that, that path and you know gotten into hip hop for real? But then again, I'm a horrible rapper. So um, yeah, which there is proof of on records. <laughs> So I'm really glad I didn't go down that path, but I'm also really glad that I discovered bands like Public Enemy because they, they're game changers, game changers for real. It's interesting to uh, think back on yourself when you were young and when I got into politics and, and I started writing p p p political lyrics, I went fucking balls out, you know. Um, I was quite unreasonable and super militant and I was one of those dudes that was just like, if you didn't sing about politics, you were a sellout. 
that kind of person. And Refused uh, was so much a part of a culture, uh, the world around us, like the music around us, but also just the people around us, that all we did was talk about politics. And even though the 90s was more of a, the person that was political, all we did was talk about politics. Um, and I also, th I think I had this naive idea that the only music that can really sort of um, emulate the frustration that we feel is, is punk and hardcore music. And then uh, I bought a Billy Bragg record. <laughs> Someone told me about him. We were on tour with Refused. I went to a record store in Kolsta uh, that is still there, I think. And I bought, talking with the tax man about poetry from 1986. And I bought the full up Workers Playtime that might be from 1987 then. And, um, I mean, it might seem banal right now, but it was like one of those like, oh shit, you can play other types of music and, and be really into the idea of revolution. You can play other types of music and you can sing about uh, politics basically. But also the fact that Billy Bragg moved seamlessly, moves, I gotta say, moves seamlessly from, you know, singing about capitalism and singing about the union to singing about relationships and love. And it all makes sense. Um, and that was an eye opener for me. I mean. I was so stuck in the idea that, you know, this is the way it's supposed to be done. So having someone like Billy Bragg come in and be like, okay, this is how I'm doing it, uh, was a big eye-opener for me. Billy Bragg, of course, is a protest singer from the UK. He started as a punk rocker. And then he just kept on playing protest songs and, uh, you know, uh, being like a true socialist his entire life. And he's still pretty fantastic. But for me, those records were massively important. and. Uh, also, interestingly enough, I bought Billy Bragg. Uh, they had like books where you had all the songs and you can learn the songs. So I actually learned how to play guitar by playing along to Billy Bragg songs. And that's how I actually learned to play guitar properly. Yeah, Billy Bragg, massive important. Also, I went and saw him live in 1996 in Stockholm. And just the way he talked about politics on stage, it was funny. It was heartfelt, it was intelligent, and it was really personal. And uh, that really influenced me in the way that I want to communicate politics with people, especially on stage, where you want to talk about these issues that are important, heavy, but we can joke about them, we can have a good time, and it can be personal. So, Billy Bragg, so important to me. So another band that was hugely important was, of course, Forney Anst, New York Hardcore. Not the clean cut youth crew New York Hardcore, but a different sort of uh, alternative uh, New York Hardcore band. This is their nine patriotic hymns from 1991. Um, Born Against was widely confrontational. Um, and they're one of those bands that we just loved. We loved their approach to, to politics, that it was just like in your face. And when the lyrics were, uh, you know, violent imagery of the world around us, they're also beautifully written and really poignant and really smart. So they're one of those bands that we truly admired how they approach their politics, even though we didn't always think they were right. I remember the, the incident where Sick of it all and, and Born Again singer Sam McPheeters had a radio interview slash debate about uh, Sick of it all being sellouts because I think they signed to a major label and it almost erupted into violence. And um, as an outsider, you could you could look at Born Again and say like, yeah, I get that. But you can also look at Sick of it all and be like, yeah, I get that too. Like, we just want to play music and we just want to be in a band. And it was interesting because we loved Sick of it all, but we also loved Born Again. Um, on the Everlasting... EP, we recorded um, an acoustic version of a Born Again song, and we were supposed to do the same thing on songs to fan the flames, but my vocal chops were not up to it, so we scrapped that idea. And when we did Shape of Punk to Come, um, we took Born Against lyrics. They had a song called Born Against the Fucking Dead, and we were writing a song called Refuse the Fucking Dead. Uh, I think it's slightly inspired by that title. And in our manifesto, we took the lyrics to Born Against the Fucking Dead, and we changed some words around as a homage to the fact that we love Born Against. Um, I know there are edge lords out there that want to be write cool think pieces about how the fact that Shape of Punk to Come is just a rip off Born Against, which is of course insane because musically and also lyrically doesn't sound anything 
like Born Against. Um, but you know, that's, that's just what people want to do. That being said, we love Born Against, and I still love Born Against. So being like fully invested in hardcore and, and falling in love with this world of hardcore around you, one of the things that always, oh, I didn't, well, it bothered me a little bit because I never felt comfortable was the fact that there's a lot of bands where the dudes just took their shirt off and they had tons of tattoos and they flexed them and they were tough and they were masculine and manly. And um, that was an aspect of hardcore that I always had, had a hard time dealing with because I never felt masculine, I never felt manly, I never felt like a tough guy. I know that in the early days of Fuse, I tried to take my shirt off and I had like one tattoo that I was like, look at my tattoo, but it was just a pose. I was never that person. Um, so when I discovered bands like Bikini Kill and the whole Riot Girl scene, that was so important to me. Um, I love the, the counterbalance of a, of a feminist voice in a world that was so defined by tough guys. And um, even as we were touring and playing with a lot of these, these bands that were tough guys, I really enjoyed this because it was something different and it felt more akin to what I was as a person. Um, I never felt comfortable being like a, a man or a masculine person. I always felt more effeminate. I always felt, you know, like, like my body didn't really fit what I was supposed to be. So when the whole Riot girl scene came and the whole queer scene came, I was like, oh, this is super interesting. And it really resonated with me. And uh, not only Bikini Kill, who I love and still love, and one of the biggest sadnesses of my life is the fact that uh, in 2020, Refused was supposed to play the West Festival uh, together with Bikini Kill. And of course, that got canceled, so that's a bit, bit of a bummer. But that whole world, that whole scene, and then I really dived into, like, you know, I love band like Slant Six and Sleety Kinney and Huggy Bear and also like Team Dresh and Spit Boy. Just a different way of approaching hardcore with a different voice. And I felt that voice for me was super important to understand uh, my own political feminism and, you know, the political person that I wanted to become. And, and uh, I'm super grateful for that because it made me... Um, become a bit more true to myself and not try to pose as a tough guy. <laughs> so I remember this really distinctly. We we're playing a show 1993, maybe 1994, um, with our friends in Mill and Colin in their hometown of Urubu. And um, for reasons that baffles me, um, they talked us into being the headliners. And this is the, at, at the height of the Millen Colin popularity in Sweden. Uh, they were like, well, we're at home, we're, we want to hang out with our friends, so you can, you, can, you can finish out the show. And we're like, well, okay, we're nice guys, so we said yes. And it was this beautiful venue and it was packed and people were going crazy for Millen Colin. And then they just left. And I remember it so vividly because for I cannot fathom what we were thinking, but we opened up with music and politics by the disposable heroes of hypocrisy. Not only did we have to follow the complete frenzy of melancholy, but we opened up with like a weird industrial hip hop track. And yeah, just people just left in droves. <laughs> um, disposable heroes of hypocrisy. We're like an industrial hip hop band uh, from, from maybe San Francisco. Uh, Michael Franti used to also be in a band called the Beatniks that put out records on alternative tentacles. And um, I don't know how this record came into our possession, but we loved it. We, we hung on to every word and songs like television, the drug of the nation. I mean, it was so powerful and it spoke to us in a way that very few records spoke to us. So it was so powerful that Refuse, well, let's play a cover tune of the song Music and Politics. Um, I don't ever want to hear a live recording of that because I'm sure that it was awful. Uh, the original is great. This record is still fucking phenomenal. 
And uh, I still live by the creed if I ever stop thinking about music and politics, you know. So disposable heroes of hypocrisy. Uh, on the Shape of Punk to Come record, there's a little quote said, in, in such an ugly time, the real protest is beauty. That's a quote taken from uh, singer-songwriter Phil Oakes. Um, in the mid-90s, someone gave me a book about Phil Oakes. I never heard him, I never heard about him. I just knew, you know, someone was like, you get, you'll get a kick out of this. And I read the book about this radical, radical uh, singer-songwriter. It's like Bob Dylan, but with like true radical ideas. And... Um, lived a troubled life, battled with mental health issues, and at the age of 36, he killed himself. I was in love with Phil Oaks even before I heard a tune of his music, and then when I heard his music, I was super excited about it. Um, it's one of those characters that just grew up in that uh, uh, Greenwich Village, you know, singer-songwriter scene, and it was really political, and he remained political, scene, political his entire life. He was also the guy that uh, had the famous quote, like, that he wanted to be a mix between uh, Elvis Presley and Che Guevara. It's something that we used with Noise Conspiracy a lot. That was like our, our mission statement. And uh, this is his second record, I Ain't Marching Anymore, from 1965. And um, I'm sure that Bill Bragg was uh, influenced by him. And, and I really, really, really loved Phil Oaks and it really resonated with me. And that just type of like protest singer attitude and approach that he had was just phenomenal and uh, yeah, check out his music. So in, I think 1996, uh, I was living in like a group house with a bunch of friends and one of my friend, friends called Eric, he told me, do you know about the situationist movement? And I'm like, no, no, not really. And he gave me a couple of books and he said, it's like, it's perfect for rock music because it's very, uh, it has a lot of slogans to it. And that also introduced, and then one of the bands that he mentioned, which I'm, I'm sure they were not really influenced by situationists because this is actually for situations, but the sloganry of, of rock and roll, uh, the MC5. Uh, I talked about situations a little bit before, where I talked about the Gray Marcus book, uh, Lipstick Traces. Um, that was massively important for me, especially uh, surrounding shape, and uh, very much so with the International Noise Conspiracy. I might do an episode where I talk a little bit more in depth about that. But the MC5, we discovered them at the tail end of Refused. We actually practiced Kick Out the Jams a couple of times. We were gonna try to play it, because we loved it. and. Uh, it brought us into like the White Panther Party, John Sinclair, uh, Dope's Guns Fucking the Streets, Abby Hoffman, the whole like yippies and the radical counterculture movement of the 60s. And when you are like engulfed in this political world, like it was so awesome to find other types of music that also sort of uh, had similar ideas in a different time, in a different place, in a different space. but. They're talking about similar things. And I mean, MC5 needs no real introduction. This is their first record and it's fucking fabulous and fantastic. Um, but they're a huge inspiration to us. Like the, the, especially in like the, the sloganry aspect of, of like uh, political lyrics and just the, the way they approach them, the way they look and the way they sound, it's fucking great. Uh, maybe a little bit more so when it came to Noise Conspiracy when we started, but as I said, Refuse, we, we actually try to to practice uh, kick out the jams <laughs> a couple of times. <laughs> but yeah, MC5, fucking phenomenal. As I said, when we started, I think we could do a couple of episodes on this topic. There's so much good political music out there. And I, I mean, in my life, in my career, I'm, maybe now I'm at 1996 or something like that. <laughs> um, so I might, might keep doing this. Um, there's. Tons of great music to inspire you when you feel tired uh, of this world or just inspire you to fight the power. Uh, the last band I'm going to talk to you about is a band that I've talked about multiple times on this show already. It's a band that I said every time I talk about it, somebody, oh, I'm going to do an episode about, about this band. And I'm, of course, talking about the Manic Street Preachers. Their third record, Holy Bible from 1994. Um, uh, this band and this record had such a huge impact. Uh, they looked like a bunch of glam rockers. 
by the situationist slogan painted on their shirts. Uh, their political language was confrontational, but also poetic, beautiful, and, and sad. Um, this record is one of the most uh, brutal, nihilistic, and beautiful records that I know of. And uh, just the way they approach songwriting and, and especially the way that their lyrics are, because they're still around, written, is something that inspired me so much. And I mean, still to this day, Manic Street Preach is one of those bands that I, I go to when I want to feel inspired to write uh, beautiful, uh, poetic, political lyrics. So I cannot re recommend them enough, and one of these days I will do an episode just about the Manic Street Preachers. And there you have it. Ten records changed my life. Well, let's keep talking about this later. Um, there's so much going on in the world right now as far as politics goes that it's just, it is important to have something that, that gives you the strength and courage to move on. I think that I think the Palestinian people need to be liberated. They need to be liberated from, you know, the, the sort of occupational forces of Israel. But they also need to be liberated from Hamas. They need to be liberated from reactionary forces that are definitely doing more harm than good. I think the Israeli people need to be liberated from the right-wing conservative war-crazed hawks that they have and the, the sort of uh, Zionist diehard settlers that keep keep committing war crimes and they keep pushing the, the boundaries of what Israel is. Um, the wave of anti-Semitism that's happening is fucking disgusting. And I think that we want to, if you want to fight oppression, if you want to fight like that kind of stuff, we need to fight it everywhere. But we also need to see why things are happening and, and sort of see the connections and structures. There's still a war going on in the Ukraine. Iranian women are still fighting for for the right to be women. Speaking of that, uh, in America, the battle for women's bodies is happening. There's 12 states that, that banned abortion. Horrible. There's a huge right wing rise in Sweden with um, disastrous consequences on, on people living here, on all immigrants that want to come here and be taken care of. It, it has a huge negative impact on culture, art, just a way of life. Um, so there's a lot to talk about and a lot to discuss. And I always felt that I'm not a politician. I'm a musician that likes to talk about political issues. And art should be a starting point for a conversation. I might, I might come off a cocksure and be like, I have all the answers, but I just, a lot of this is just, you want a conversation. You want people to think, you want people to react, and you want to start a conversation, and you want to be, have an open mind so you can listen to other people's opinions and try to figure out why people act the way they do. And um, yeah, be kind to each other, take care of each other, listen to each other, and uh, hopefully we can build a better world together. Um, yeah, until next time, stay well, my friends. Bye bye.